Howdy. Yeehaw, motherfuckers. <laughs> Welcome. Well- Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Welcome to Say Smut, a literary podcast for readers and non-readers. Woo, yeehaw, that's Sarah, and she loves books. And that's Hope, and she loves talking. Uh, Each episode, I break down the plots of some pretty wild books to Hope, who has not read them. And spoiler alert, she didn't read this one either. But I didn't. Um, Now, before we get too far into this podcast, you can probably tell we're going Western today. Going out to the great yes. frontier, uh, the great uh, wild west. And before we get in, I want to give you some content warnings. Um, obviously, we're going to deal with some sexual content per usual. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But we do have panic attacks, severe injury, and death of a parent. And so if any of those are not your cup of tea, subscribe, come back later, and we'll chat about something else. Yeah, you're welcome to ski daddle, partner. Yes. <laughs> I love this so much. I just feel like we need to now have themed podcasts every time. It's also so not my personality. Famously, uh, I I love music, but I can't love country like I've tried. Yeah. And so it's so opposite of my whole personality to be like, yeehaw, roll roll tide. (laughs) Roll tide. Uh, The only exception is Dolly Parton, our Lord and Savior. Well, yeah, Um, everybody loves Dolly Parton. That would be crazy if I didn't love Dolly Parton. Absolutely. And then obviously Shania Twain, let's go girls. I sang some Rascal Flats in choir in junior high. <laughs> I did as well. We did for show choir, Life is a Highway. Isn't God that Rascal bless Flats? the broken road that led me straight to you guys. <laughs> I'm going to be really embarrassed if Rascal Flats didn't sing Life is a Highway. It's from the they Cars did a song. cover of Life is a Highway. Okay. Yeah. It's on the car soundtrack. That's yeah. all that matters. I think specifically for the car soundtrack, but they're not the originators. Anyway. <laughs> um, now, as this we're is going, our music podcast, this is, and this is where we uh, analyze music for you and tell you our trauma behind uh, country music. Because I worked at retail uh, for a while, and of course, they only played country music, which was my personal hell. And but, my very first boyfriend only listened to country music, oh, so no. I tried so hard. I tried so hard for you, sir. I'm sorry, I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I, I do have to it. say, I went to a Luke Bryan concert once with for my friend's 21st birthday, and it was a rootin' tootin' good time. Um, I went to, before they were the chicks, I saw the chicks uh, when I was a little kid with my cousins. Like, nice. Earl had to die. Like, yeah. uh, Bush sucks era chicks concert. What a, what a fun time. Yeah, honestly, like, the best time to go to a, a chicks concert, I would say, actually. Very true. Well, this uh, podcast, we are covering Done and Dusted by Lila Sage. And this is kind of an exciting one because we've done, I've I've been very particular to pick out a lot of popular books. And this one is like coming up in the book talk ranks right now. Oh. Um, it came out June 6th. And so it's of really new. Yeah, it's really wow. new. I feel like such an influencer. Um, it's less than <laughs> 300 pages for those of you who don't like a long read. But on, I'm going to give you the ratings right now. Um, Story Graph, we've got a 4.08 out of 5. Goodreads, we got a 4.12. Very that good. is excellent. That's I high. gave it a 5. I'm going to am- say off the top. Maybe ignore our ratings at the end because yeah. I'm very concerned about how they'll relate to the more valid ratings of Goodreads. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I'm just going to put that out there already. But also it could be one of those things that it's like just because the masses love it doesn't mean it's actually good. That's true. I am entitled to my own opinion, but also famously our rating system. Our rating weird. system sucks. So. Could be better. We'll not change it, but could be better. We know you guys aren't here for the rating system. You're here oh. to hear about the smut. So um, I should disclose, too, that um, uh, there's not a lot about this author that I can get into. This is her first official book. I think she wrote some erotica that got published in, like, Sweet. the year's best erotica. But um, anyway, so this first book of hers came out in june and the second one is coming out this fall spoiler Ooh. alert uh for those of you guys who love a good series that's all built in the same world and same groups of friends and family this is, is going to follow the writer siblings so each mm-hmm. book is probably going to be a different writer sibling and we'll get into that at the end i'll explain 
Is it going to um, be a Western theme, you think? Oh, it's all Western theme. Yes, we That's are good. We are going out West for all of this. So put on your cowgirl hats, put on, put on your cowboy hats, put on your cow person hats. Put on your cow people hats. And um, let's get in. So uh, I will say too that um, Lila doesn't have a whole lot on her, but she does have a sweet old blind pit bull, which oh. we love because um, Hope has a sweet part pit bull. It's that true. has one brain cell to him. And simple. He, is, he is a simple little boy. His name um, is Deku and he's a little dummy. I love him so much. Ah, oh, Deku. All hail Deku. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, but I'm about to praise this book a lot. But here's cool. here's going to be my criticism off the top. Mm -hmm. There is really great mental health representation. The author starts the book with an author's note talking about how, you know, the main character has ADHD and this reflects her own personal experience. And that's great. Cool. However, there is like no diversity otherwise. Oh man. Um, which is so disappointing because Westerns are already known to be very white and straight and cisgender dominated. Mm -hmm. So I would have loved to have seen some more diversity in this. Um, but obviously I just want to start off the top there. So, uh, we're going to dive right in, okay? Um, are you ready, Hope? Yeah, I dove right in. Are you saddled up? Yeah, I've saddled up my horse and I'm riding into the city, ready to talk about this book. Awesome. Well, we open on our main character, Clementine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's good for me. <laughs> Don't worry, she already makes fun of her name in the oh, first page. Oh, my darling. No, oh, my darling. No, oh, my darling. <laughs> Clementine. Don't, don't sing that too long because uh I don't want to get copied. Yeah, copyrighted. I don't I don't know where that's at in the public space. I just I know, know I sang either. it a lot in elementary school. That's very true. <laughs> My mother is a music teacher, so she would uh make us sing that. Um okay, but she goes by Emmy. So mm -hmm. we'll refer to her as Emmy. She's returning home to Meadowlark, Wyoming. Okay. She just shows up at her best friend Teddy's house with her truck full of belongings after not really being home for 10 years. Like she'd come home a little bit here on and off for like holidays and whatnot, but only see her family for a very short amount of time. Okay. So she's been in Denver the last few years riding professionally as a barrel racer. Uh -huh. Um, Literally, she broke up with her boyfriend using a post-it note. And this is where I need Sex in the City oh, fans no. to chime in and remember that Burger broke up with Carrie on a, on a post-it note. It's um, not a good way to do that. I'm going to just say. Not yeah, great. Yeah. And then packed up her shit and left. And well, so. That sucks. <laughs> clearly, she's running from something. I will note right now that the boyfriend was very controlling and like okay. wouldn't even let her talk to her bestie on the phone okay, like that's fine i take order her food for her at a restaurant which i still don't Ew. understand why people do that it's so weird but i i asked hope to give us a whole report on barrel racing but i'm not going to give her the full i'm not going to have her give the full report right now i just want you to give us the definition of barrel racing can you tell yes. us what it is Yeehaw. What is barrel racing? I'm so happy to tell you. A lot of my research actually came from uh, Iowa State University's extension <gasps> office. I'm really Yay! happy to tell you. Um, Which is so fun for me because I went to Iowa State it, University it and Hope went to the University of Iowa. That's and it's true. It's just a good time all around. Yeah. we're uh, At the University of Iowa, we were busy doing cool and fun stuff and not writing about what barrel racing is. So... <laughs> Oh no, we just all are this, ag school. Yeah, all so. of this info was, was from uh, Iowa State. So uh, barrel racing technically started in 1931 um, in its original form. That's something I just looked up now because I realized earlier I hadn't looked it up before. But just so you know, that's about what it started. Um, and here's what it is. Is this your first rodeo? Don't worry, it's mine too. Here's what barrel racing is because I didn't know before I did this research. So first... Uh, you're at a rodeo, typically, or a okay. rodeo adjacent, you know, event. Um, if you've never been to a rodeo and maybe never seen pictures of it, I don't know why you wouldn't, but let's say you haven't. Um, think arena, and then, like, in the middle of the arena, it's usually, like, I think sandy or, mm -hmm. like, dirt surface. Um, and then a lot of stuff obviously happens in the middle. When they do barrel racing, they take three uh, barrels, usually, 
Uh, they are 55 gallon metal barrels because there's standards for this kind of stuff. We'll get into maybe later. Um, but they set three barrels in like a triangular pattern. Um, and then the rider on their horse will come out and essentially they have to ride around all three of the barrels and circle each barrel in a pattern. Um, it is typically called a clover pattern. So you come out, it doesn't matter if you start left or right, but you come out and then you pick a direction. You go around the first barrel and then go across to the next barrel and then go up to the third one and shoot back down. Um, there are lots of diagrams on what this looks like. It is much easier to understand if you see it than to hear yeah. it in podcast form. So I'm sorry. Yes, um, but look it up because I definitely had to look it up while I was reading yes. to get a visual. But yeah, so, um, and then they time how fast you do that. And I know what you're thinking like, ah, the fastest horse wins. Awesome. But this is not necessarily so because there can be time penalties. So if you're going around the barrels and you knock a barrel over, that's a five second penalty. Um, you can like touch a barrel or if the barrel weeble wobbles, but it doesn't fall down, that doesn't have, have a time penalty attached to it. But if you knock one over, that's five seconds off. Um, deviating from the ride pattern. So like not doing the barrels in the correct order or missing a barrel entirely will usually I think disqualify you entirely. There's also a 60 second time limit to go around all the barrels. So if you uh, take longer than a minute, usually you don't get a score for that either. Okay. Because That's just like baseline what, uh, what barrel racing is. Yes. Perfect. Because we'll get into some of that time stuff later and Emmy's career, mm -hmm. but she does. Wait barrel racing and she has for the last she's done it professionally for many years now assume she's around 27 ish that's the age range of our girl um decrepit and, by the standards of most of our books yeah decrepit if we're talking <laughs> so historical old. romance Damn. um but anyway she gets back in town she literally literally shows up at teddy's house and she's like i'm here and teddy's like great. I'm not going to ask any questions. You're my bestie. I am That's here so to nice. support you. Um, so the, she's like, you know what we need to do? We need to go out and get some drinks. So they go to the local hole in the wall bar called the devil's boot, the devil's boot, the devil's boot. And she sees some pretty normal townies there, including her old prom date. She went to prom mm -hmm. with, um, but she also sees Sweet. Luke Brooks. Her oh. brother's best friend, who was practically a part of the family, a lady's son man. of Garth Brooks. No, <laughs> no, um, he's Sorry. a ladies' man and all around douchebag. So let's get some descriptions. All right, yes, please. Do obviously, we have eye colors? You know, I'm gonna yes, ask. I do. I have eye colors for you. <sighs> Amazing. Okay, Amazing. obviously, they make our female main character petite with uh brown, dark hair, and tan. I, again, need people to stop making these women stick thin. Uh, I am not trying. I just, there's too many out there. I need there's some more. There's so many more body out. shapes that yes. you could choose from. And we could try uh, several, maybe yes. some next time. Anyway. But meanwhile, Luke is about 32 years old. And he has lighter oh, brown Elderly. hair. Elderly. <laughs> That's but, older than me by a but, whole year. <laughs> but in historical romance context, he yeah. is not. He's perfect marriage age. I hate, I hate people. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, mean, so he's got lighter brown hair and... Mm -hmm. That's a little bit long and like a little wavy, but like mm -hmm. just long enough that he could tuck behind the ears if he wanted to. Sure. Okay. Um, and he doesn't have a beard, but his facial hair grows out quite a bit throughout the day. So he gets some scruff, you know, mm -hmm. like a five o'clock shadow. Yeah. 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 And he's obviously tall, you know, we got to yeah. make him tall, but, um, He's described to have brown eyes. Yes! Oh, yeah. rules! And she's described to have dark eyes. So we can go ahead and assume that it's probably brown or maybe like a dark green or whatever. Oh, black like Satan. Yeah. <laughs> she's from the devil's boot. The devil's boot. <laughs> oh, are her eyes dark? That rules. Anyway. So One point for the brown eyed people. <laughs> if you go to our social media, I have compiled a list of who I would cast and I included a lot of actors of color in there because I would love to see them play these roles, even though their descriptions right. don't necessarily match 
all the white people in this book. Use your imagination. It's not hard. But stereotypically, I had Sebastian Stan as um, our main guy, Luke here. And I had Olivia Cook, who, um, if you don't know, Sebastian Stan is in like the Marvel movies. Um, Mm -hmm. He's like in like the Winter Soldier and all that stuff. Anyway, and then Olivia Cook is in the new show uh, for House of the Dragons. She plays the older Allison Hightower. So if you just need some visualization there. Uh Um, Okay. But I would also love to see Natalie Emmanuel, who was in the Game of Thrones series. She was kind of the interpreter for the queen, dragon queen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then who did I have as? Oh, Louis Tan, uh, who is a part of like the Mortal Kombat um he's like super hot sword wielding man um he, i just needed like a bad boy you know right yeah so anyway gotta if you have want a my, bad boy if you want my full casting I, that i got super hyper fixated on last night uh go to our social media yeah. to see that. it is it is say smut podcast on instagram and tiktok and i believe twitter go to those twitter, yeah <laughs> we did um, it we talked about the we social, talked media about our social media we did our job <laughs> Uh, so Luke clearly sees her and is like, damn, my best friend's little sister really grew up hottie McHottie. Mm -hmm. Um, and he starts taking shots because he's like, I don't know how to cope with seeing her in my bar. Uh, interesting. Very weird. I don't know how to deal with these feelings because men never do. So wild behavior, but I guess I can't verify if that's how dudes be or not. Yes. And this is also new development that he owns this bar emmy does not Mm. know he owns this bar okay um so emmy appears to go home with that old prom date she does run into luke and like they had like this little like you know spat back and forth and then like she appears like she's gonna go home with her old prom date but he Mm -hmm. just gives her a ride because she had been drinking Uh, with her friend and but luke doesn't know that my old prom dates would probably give me a ride they were both very nice um, yeah, I'm trying to think my old prom dates. Yeah, they were nice. I mean, they yeah. would give me a ride. I, don't think... <laughs> I only dated one of them. And I think him and I are past that enough that he would give me a ride home. I didn't date either of them. Well, I went back for a prom after I graduated. And that was like the first time I went with somebody that I dated. I do think all three people would give me rides. But yeah. I, I, I've not asked. <laughs> ah. Maybe not. Maybe they're like, get out. <laughs> Will your would your prom date from how many years ago give you a ride home from the bar? Uh, we'll do a poll on our social media. <laughs> hey, uh, Eric and Eric, would you give me a ride? <laughs> hey, Travis and uh, who else did I go with? I don't need Mike. one, but would you? <laughs> uh, Thanks. Anyway, so sh- so she goes home with this guy, and Luke thinks she's gone home home with the guy, right. and he gets a little jealous. Sure. So. Luke calls, gets a call from her brother in the morning and he kind of accidentally spills the beans that she's back in town because apparently the family doesn't know she's back in town. Oh, oops. Um, And now I'm going to unfold some backstory that happens Uh, over the course uh, of like uh, two uh. chapters. Okay. Paint me a word picture. Yes. Let me paint you a picture. I'll I'll give you a little family tree. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So she's got two older brothers. Okay. August, who goes by Gus and Weston, who goes by Wes. Gus uh-huh. is like the super serious, overprotective older brother. Mm-hmm. Grumpy, grumpy. Um, and then Wes is kind of the softy golden retriever caretaker. Like he's protective, but he's more like, I just want to take care of people. Sure. And her dad um, runs the ranch. Mm-hmm. And her mom died when she was less than a year old from a horse accident. Because Mm -hmm. her mom used to be a horse rider. And um, they own one of the biggest ranches in the area. I see. And it is called Rebel Blue, I think. Yeah, Rebel Blue. Rebel Blue. Um, Okay, so we find out that Gus, many years ago, had a one-night stand that got a woman pregnant. (gasps) Oh! And they are not together because they are only friends and they're happily co-parenting their daughter, Riley. That's great. It's beautiful. Um, We also know that Gus hates Teddy 
He thinks that Teddy is a terrible influence on his sister and is no good. And I am already smelling an enemies to lovers book coming up between Gus and Teddy. And, and Teddy is the, is the friend, is the right? Friend. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Um, and then finally we find out that Luke was a product of an affair his mom had with some townie. A scandal. Yeah. Not and Jimmy the townie. Oh no. Jimmy the townie. And so his mom, did, he wasn't very liked by his, obviously his stepdad or his sure. siblings. Yeah. Um, and so they never really wanted him around. Some real Jon Snow shit. Yes. Seriously. If we're going to make this all references to Game of Thrones. <laughs> this whole podcast is now about Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, which I could go off about Game of Thrones. I love Game of Thrones so much. Uh, the show. I haven't read the mm. books because I, George R. R. Martin, we've got problems. But... <laughs> Anyway, uh, so his dad didn't also really didn't want him, but a few years ago, his dad died and turns out his dad owned the devil's boot oh. and, um, he left him the bar and like his old house. Okay. So now sure. Luke had kind of grown up without his family and the Ryder family had kind of taken him in as their own. So, okay. okay. So after the whole family finds out she's back in town. Emmy moves into a small cabin on the ranch and is unloading boxes. Of course, who do, comes by but Luke and sees that she needs help unpacking boxes. Mm -hmm. So during this whole unpacking scene, she gets injured and like cuts open oh, her God. arm and she starts freaking Ooh. out seeing the blood. And oh, he, sure. like, he's like, this is weird because like you've never had a problem with blood before. Blo like getting injuries on on the ranch is not uncommon right it's rough and tumble out here it's rough it's it's, it's done and dusted out here um it's done and, dusted. <laughs> and so uh she, he like brings her over to the sink puts her up on the counter he's taking care of her it's a great does injury. he like hoist her up onto the counter i i want to i can't remember exactly but i want to think so I'm going to um, choose to believe yes. I down. love it. Uh, so he gets her on a counter and he starts taking care of her injury. And after mm -hmm. they're looking at each other, like, we're going to kiss. This is going to yes. happen. And the mood's just right. He just uh -huh. rescued her. Oh and he might be high from the fumes of the disinfectant. We don't know. And they're lightly I'm touching. not sure. I'm not 100% sure if that's how that works. But, but they're lightly touching. And mm -hmm. he's leaning in. And bam! Wes walks in. He doesn't see anything, but he interrupts them. Five so. at a dollar for every time my brother has interrupted me, ki <laughs> almost kissing or kissing someone, I'd have exactly one dollar. Oh. <laughs> Drew, I need you to come on the podcast and have a conversation. Please don't. Anyway. <laughs> so by this point in the story, we know that Emmy has experienced an injury last month. We don't know what it is. But we know it's causing her a mental block in her racing. We know because she told she us. She told us in her internal dialogue okay. that okay. like something has happened last month, mm -hmm. an injury, and she's stuck on it, and it's making her so she feels like she can't get on the horse. And it just reminds me of like Simone, Simone Biles. Biles. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the twenty. I want you to know that in my Biles. ears we said Simone Biles and yeah at the exact same time. <laughs> I hope that comes through on the recording. It might not, but know that for me, it was good. Uh, but anyway, so she's in this mental block. Mm -hmm. A week later, she she's managed to avoid Luke, and she's been sulking in her cabin. But there's this really cute moment when Teddy brings Emmy a bunch of stuff to get her settled in, and Gus walks into the cabin. And this is why, like, I need Gus's book next, but I know it's Wes's book next. We'll get into it later. Sure. But... Gus walks into the cabin and then you have Teddy and Gus in the same room. The mm -hmm. sexual tension is palpable. Great. And he's like, Theodora, I thought I banned you from Rebel Blue, which is the ranch. And Rebel she's like, Blue. I thought I told you to never call me that again or I would shove a fence post down your throat. <laughs> and oh. the bickering is just phenomenal. Great. And um, she even does like on her way out, she does the, what's that? And like points to something on his shirt and then like flicks his nose. Uh, <laughs> like it's just that level of pettiness. <laughs> like, it's just like, I will fuck with this person as much as possible. <sighs> uh, so anyway, after Teddy leaves, Emmy confesses that she's 
back for more than just a break. She's like, you know, I did move all my shit back here. It's not like I'm just here for a week or two, right? right. She's moving back. And by this right. point, no one has asked her why, which is kind of weird. But we'll get into that a little waiter, later. Mm-hmm. Waiter. A little waiter. Um, a, a, little, little waiter. a little restaurant waiter. A little re- restaurant waiter. His name's Tim and he's just a little waiter. <laughs> but Gus is like, we're down a ranch hand. So I don't need your help around here. Like, you're going to have to pull your weight. Mm-hmm. So they go to the big house for a late breakfast. Okay. Mm. Which I love when they call it the big house. I don't know why. It just feels very communal. Mm. I don't know. But uh, now her brother and her dad have returned and it's like going to have like a nice little family breakfast. But who's there? Luke Brooks, because he's also practically a part of the family. He just keeps showing up. Unfortunately, nothing happens in this scene, really. But do they have a good breakfast? Yeah, I guess so. But I think it's just like a reunion moment because her dad and her brother had been out of town when she came mm-hmm. in. So mm-hmm. it was kind of like, oh, everybody's back now. Yeah, it's like when Harry Potter comes to the Weasley's house. And yeah. for, first, Mrs. Weasley has to do her yelling at the kids. But then she's like, oh, Harry, so ah. great to see you. Have some breakfast. <laughs> yeah, everybody gather around. Uh, so Luke has this internal dialogue where he realizes she's not going writing over the last few days of being home, which is crazy because she's always been on a horse. Like she can never get, they can never get her off the horse, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, he like notices her uh, and there's almost like this tone of everybody's just excited. She's back. So they don't want to spook her by like getting into her business. Spook her like a horse. Yeah. Um, This is something we didn't talk about on the podcast and won't move on, (laughs) (laughs) but it's fine. Um, we're just gonna breeze past it. The way that I <laughs> instinctually said it, though, is really At the beginning, telling, I think. <laughs> before we start recording, she did say, I'm not gonna bring this up during the podcast, and then immediately references it in the podcast. <laughs> but yes, she is essentially, they don't want to yeah. spook her yes. like a horse. Yeah. Um, because they're like, we just are happy to have her home. She never comes home. Like, yes. like let her do her thing. Yes. Um, which, like, leads to later that, uh, the day after the Ako Taco breakfast where Luke is mucking out the stalls and Emmy mm-hmm. comes in and he's like, Oh, are you going to go ride? And she's like really sketchy about replying. And she's like, um, yeah. And he watches her as she like leads her horse out of this, the stable and like gets her all like ready. And she's like shaking really, really bad. You can't do that. Cause horses know, man. Yeah, but like, and these are her horses. Like, these are her right. her horses. They're gonna know when you're feeling. They know bad, her. And they're they're and gonna react when you feel bad. There's this really sweet moment where she's brushing the horse and she's shaking so bad, and he like comes up behind her Does and he puts his hand, hand on, on her hand. <laughs> yes, so that's cute. nice. And then she starts like tearing up, and she's like, "Leave me alone!" And he's like, Relatable. "No, no." Uh, so then she confides into him what happened in Denver. Mm -hmm. So she was thrown from a horse and knocked into a fence and she was like out cold. And when she woke up, there was blood coming out of her eyes. And like this should have, and she's like, I obviously hit my head really hard in a weird way. And I like, it could have been way worse given the circumstances could be full dead. Yeah. And obviously this is going to drudge up feelings about her mom who was killed from a riding accident. Oh yeah. Okay. So at this point, will you please give us a report on the dangers of <laughs> barrel racing slash horses? Yes, I will. Um, before I get started on my report called hordes horse sense, the power of horses. Have you ever ridden a horse before Sarah? I have. Mm-hmm. I uh, not like super actively, but I've been on a horse. Yes. Cool. Cool. I have also once at a dude ranch as a Girl Scout oh. been on a horse. I was just curious if, if you'd had that experience. Or yes, not. I have. Cool. So it's not your first rodeo, but if it was it a rodeo, is- would it be your first rodeo? Because I have been to a rodeo before. I, I don't know if I could say I've been to an outright rodeo before. So it would, it would technically be my first rodeo. My family would go down to Arizona bunch and we, there was a couple times that we went to a rodeo. So yes, uh, I wouldn't say I'm like an active rodeo person, sure, but sure. I have seen, I've witnessed. 
Amazing. Well, as Sarah said, she asked me to research kind of two things combined into one. First is the power of horses. And second is more details on barrel racing and its dangers. Um, I am going to finish out kind of talking about barrel racing. And then I'm going to talk specifically about the power of horses. Because I think once you understand how barrel racing goes down and then you hear how strong horses are, you'll be like, pretty self-explanatory. So uh, as we'd said previously... Barrel racing at a rodeo, you set up three barrels in a triangular pattern. Um, a rider is on their horse. They have to go around the circle around the barrels in a specific pattern as fast as they can, and they're timed. Um, and then the fastest time, including any penalties that might occur, is is the winner. Um, that's the bulk of it, but it's important for context to kind of understand how fast this happens because... Um, it's hard to kind of picture how, how fast we're talking. Um, the average race time for a barrel race depends on the size of the arena. And there are standards for how you set up the barrels, but that felt like a lot to get into. Iowa State University's extension office says that um, the average race time is typically in the range of 12 to 30 seconds. So a person is going on a horse around a bunch of barrels in like a crazy a uh, four leaf or uh, not four leaf clover, but a crazy clover pattern, and all of it's getting done in usually at most if you're doing it right around 30 seconds, but typically way faster than that. Yeah. And for reference, they constantly refer to her like record breaking numbers, which include like her doing it in 15 seconds. Interesting. I'm really glad that you brought that up. I did look up a couple of record times. There, I had a hard time finding very consistent ways to track this stuff. Um, one very common story that came up in my research is that a barrel racer named Carly Pierce has one of the fastest known times. She raced uh, 13.46 seconds with her horse wow. at the uh, 2011 National Finals Rodeo, which is like the big rodeo where this stuff happens more recently though i found um in the 2022 national finals rodeo which is um yeah just more recent they do several rounds of this so this was one of the rounds of barrel racing um a rider by the name of Haley kinzel completed a, a run in 13.34 seconds and wow. not only is that faster than the first thing, which is already a crazy amount of time, but, and I saw the video, she lost one of the reins she was holding. <laughs> so she's pretty much like m mostly by leg strength and kind of with one hand holding onto this horse and completes the run in a record amount of time. It's bonkers. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> it's bonkers. The video is insane. I recommend looking up. Um, barrel racing and horses, just horses in general are incredibly dangerous because they're big and they're fast. Um, for barrel racing in particular, obviously speeds of horses is going to depend on the breed of horses and training and all kinds of different stuff. Usually um, the kind of horses that are used are uh, uh, quarter horses or American quarter horses, and they are bred pretty specifically to be good at sprinting and shit. So they're just like, re they're really, really fast horses. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of stuff you're dealing with. Um, I, with the knowledge of how barrel racing works and what the setup is like and how fast it's happening, I then want to transition to just sort of the brute strength of horses, <laughs> which uh, if you're Are not going to unlock a new fear for me, horses, I mean, I mean look, horses, they're, I think that they're nice and gentle. They are often used in therapy. I didn't get into this in my research, but that is very true. Uh, horses are very sweet and nice. They just can also definitely kill you. <laughs> Yeah, okay, that's fair. That's absolutely so, fair. So to start, I would like to open with a quote from the great Miles Henry over at Horse Racing Sense, which is just a website that I found. Um, and Miles Henry, uh, just a guy who really likes animals, including horses. And I love him. He's my new best friend. Anyway, Miles Henry on HorseRacingSense.com said, quote, Horses are strong enough to pull up to three times their weight, carry over 400 pounds, bite with a force of over 500 PSI, and kick hard enough to kill a human. Horses are so strong, they could put a beat down on Chuck Norris. <laughs> Which, wow. I want to say Did Chuck respond to these accusations? Not that I'm aware of, but I invite you now, Chuck Norris, who definitely listens to the podcast, to please come on our show and respond to whether or not a horse could yeah. kick your ass. Yeah. 
We'd like to put this to the test. I would love for you to come on our podcast and tell me if you could or couldn't beat the shit out of a horse. Anyway. <laughs> we do not um, condone animal cruelty here. We don't here. condone animal cruelty, but we might condone a 1v1 battle between Chuck Norris and the world's strongest horse, depending on the circumstances of the fight. <laughs> so, um, straight up, I have no real way of fact-checking any of these figures that, um, that Miles has included in his quote, but... Um, my amazing friend Miles and also an article from the University of Minnesota's extension office. Shout out to extension office for knowing shit about horses. Um, both of those horses said a generally fit and healthy light riding horse can carry about 20% of its ideal body weight. But the actual amount of its weight that it's able to carry depends on how much that horse weighs and what kind of horse it is, um, how healthy it is, stuff like that. But for example... In theory, a 2,000 pound draft horse could potentially carry 400 pounds of stuff. Um, That doesn't mean like they all can or that they should or that you should over a long period of time because a horse carrying its maximum amount of weight is going to, for after a while, mess up the horse. Uh, But like feasibly, that's how much weight a horse could carry. And I believe that's like carry on top of, not pull behind it. Yeah. Um, So, like, that's some context for uh, uh, strength. I'm doing like a bench press. <laughs> yeah, some lifting. Watch, watch the video on our social media channels. I've just been exercising this whole time. Um, but they can also pull a lot of weight too. So the internet, I found, repeatedly love to say that a single draft horse could pull a load of up to 8,000 pounds. Oh my God. But I don't really have a way to qualify like... I wouldn't qualify it as song, strong scientific reporting. Just several different places kind of randomly stated that that was a possible thing. Um, another thing to kind of quick note pertaining to the term like a light horse versus a draft horse and stuff like that. Horses are called weird stuff um, depending on their temperament. Most commonly, horses are referred to as being either hot bloods or hot blooded or cold bloods or cold blooded, but it doesn't refer to their literal blood um it refers to like hot-blooded horses have more sensitivity and energy so a good a a race horse is what would be considered a hot-blooded or a hot blood horse um a cold-blooded horse is quieter and calmer usually a working horse a draft horse that you know pulls stuff so sometimes hot bloods are or light horses or riding horses are all like different ways to refer to the same kind of horse, but basically a horse that is going to be like a runner and a, a sporty horse Mm -hmm. is hot blooded or a light horse or a race horse. And then like big draft horses and working horses are called cold, cold bloods. So, um, the general rule is like a a race horse, like a fast horse, hot blooded horse can carry about 20% of its weight, ideal body weight if it's healthy. So that's one important note on the strength of horses. Another important thing to know about horses is that they have very fast reflexes and are able to enact their uh, fight or flight response very quickly because they're prey animals. So according to the British Columbia's ASPCA, horses can go from standing still to kicking you in 0.3 seconds, which (laughs) is alarming. a, a good thing to know for an animal that can feasibly carry, uh, 20% of its body weight and pull a lot more than that um, for them to be able to very fast kick you. Horses also have nearly 360 degrees of vision. They only have two blind spots, which are right in front of them and directly behind them. So they might not know you're behind them and then kick the shit out of you and kill you. But also just in general, I find it alarming that an animal that could be dangerous to you under poor circumstances can see almost 360 degrees around it. Yeah. That's scary. (laughs) Is, um, More important notes per Wikipedia, a horse can canter, which is like the step below running um, at between 9.9 and 16.8 miles per hour, which is already pretty fast. They can gallop. So like a full speed run at between 25 and 30 miles per hour. But the fastest racehorse um, per both the wiki and uh, the Guinness World Records website ran like 43.97 43.97 miles per hour. That was a horse called Winning Brew, which I think is a funny name. Excellent. And they ran that fast at the Penn National Race Course in Grantville, Pennsylvania on May 14th of 2008. But all that to say, like, horses are super, super fast. Yeah. 
super fast. Um, yeah, winning brew this horse was able to run a quarter of a mile in 20.57 seconds, which is disgusting. Um, so yeah, like in conclusion, absolutely, of course, a horse could kill you. They are huge and strong. Um, they could even have between 10 and 12 abs. I'm not able to confirm that, but I they are very Please strong. reference uh, a couple of episodes ago. Please listen to all of our episodes to understand what I'm talking about. But just know that horses probably have hella abs that could definitely kill you. Um, I'm going to wrap up with a quote from uh, the Emergency Medical Journal about horses and, and horse injuries, uh, which says this. The possible lethal power of a horse, which is capable of delivering a kick with the force of up to one ton, was described by ancient Arabs with the proverb, quote, the grave yawns for the horseman. Horseback riding accidents and injuries caused by horses carry a high risk of severe trauma. In addition, a horse's kick can transfer a force of more than 10,000 newtons to the body, causing fractures of the skull or other bones, as well as devastating damage to the intestines. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Oh, of course my- a horse could kill you. <laughs> my gosh. Look, well, that was yes. delightfully frightening. Mm-hmm. Um, thank You're you for but enforcing they're generally, our fears. They're generally gentle and nice. Bas- I mean, basically, it is like, if a horse gets scared, which it is pro- generally prone to doing... Um, yeah, it might it might buck or kick, and in that way you could be harmed. If you get stepped on by a horse, that you'll probably get squished to death because horses are big and heavy. Like, yeah, ba- uh, and basic I- stuff like that. But they're not like on the hunt to kick humans to death. No. <laughs> Which, for reference in this book, she says that when that accident happened in Denver, mm-hmm. it was a horse she hadn't been working with. The horse had been acting weird that morning right. and it bucked her, right? So, and right. then her mom, we find out later, her mom was bucked from a horse and hit her head on a rock. And so it wasn't mm-hmm. necessarily that the horse, like, right. actively yeah. was aggressive or anything. It was just the circumstances. Um, right. Plus so- the height speed, a lot of it too, is specifically with barrel racing, is you're going very fast on an animal so if you're thrown off that animal at a very fast speed a bad thing is going to happen to your body or, or you can even just like fall off the horse in a way that hurts you or yeah. like fall off and in a barrel so like it's all very dangerous it's not all the horses fall but no. the, throwing the horse into it doesn't make it less dangerous we're not trying to spread horse slander around no, here we're not. not at all well thank please you please so don't sue us horses <laughs> please don't sue us horses or chuck norris um so thank you so much for that report that was delightfully frightening um but uh we're gonna jump back into the situation we were in which is obviously emmy is freaking out she's getting nervous and the girl is in full panic attack mode Mm -hmm. um and he's like tell me what you need and i will do it like what do you need in this moment and he's like anything and she says squeeze please and he just puts his arms around her and squeezes her and like he lowers her to the ground so he can hold her and like rock her back and forth and um this is like devastating to him because he's like i know you like i know she loves barrel racing and she was born to ride a horse Uh and she's like this is like her losing a piece of her and so the only thing that would have made that cuter is if after she said squeeze please he did it and then he was like now how about squeeze cheese and then comforted her with a nice snack of like crackers and some cheese whiz oh that sounds delightful it's the perfect date it's the perfect date an anxiety attack and cheese squeeze please (laughs) squeeze cheese uh well she's you should also know that he's been teaching horse back riding lessons at the ranch for the past couple of years they actually mm-hmm. restarted them when um gus had his daughter because obviously they did away with them when um emmy's mom died mm-hmm. um but they brought him back when obviously riley was born and right. they wanted to get her on horse um but so luke offers to help her and he's like let's bring you back to the basics and get you back comfortable on a horse again okay and honestly i i as somebody who suffers from severe panic attacks, like mm-hmm. very physical panic attacks, this was so relatable to me because everybody handles anxiety attacks differently. But right. there's something about being like comforted in that way by somebody you trust. And I just felt like that was really great. It was a really great scene. I also, and this is not a bit, 
do sincerely find it comforting to like feel pressure or be squished or use a like a weighted blanket if I'm feeling yeah, really anxious. That, so that that is relatable to it, at least my experience. That's what they say about weighted blankets and stuff. And mm-hmm. it's like, you know, you just need something to kind of ground you in that moment. So they start off slow with these little lessons and they just start by walking the horse. Mm-hmm. Um, and they start actually with her childhood horse, which is um, like very retired, very elderly, very calm and chill, not her racing horse. He was like, right. I'm not going to make you get on your racing horse right now. Um, it's like a nice old horse named Gertrude or something. Very yeah. Chill. What was the horse's name? I'm going to forget it now. But anyway, yeah, it was a delightful little name. Um, but uh, they start slow. And during this time, they just start talking about like their favorite movies and what bands do they listen to? And it's just like mm-hmm. this casual time for them to chat. And it's also revealed that his relationship uh, with his mom and siblings is very strained obviously and he like practically has no relationship with them so sad so then there's this great conversation between emmy and her dad about why he took luke in when he was a kid and he said luke was fearless as a kid and he didn't want luke to turn into his dad and he says quote what started out as being fearless just turned into being reckless as he got older Oh, referring sure. to the dad. Right? Yeah. Right. And I thought that was a really interesting quote. Cause like there's a different, and then he talks about, there's a difference between being careless and being reckless. Mm-hmm. Like careless is like when you slip and you let your guard down on certain things, whereas being reckless is when you consciously do something, you know, is going to be bad. Right. At first he was fearless and he did barrel racing, but then he turned into a horse and challenged Chuck Norris to a one V one fight. And that was reckless. That was reckless. You can't just do that. Well, you should also know that her boyfriend back in Denver, um, let she broke up with through a sticky note was a Uh mega asshole. Like I said, yeah, he's like texting her. Unfortunately, I thought this was going to come to fruition as something. It doesn't. Oh, um. (laughs) So I felt a little disappointed because I was like, why do we care? that he's still texting her and stuff like he all right (laughs) okay and it's just kind of like a footnote in all of this so i have to ask how do you feel about ripped muscle t-shirts ripped muscle t i need to better understand what you're okay so like you mean like that you're gonna cut the sleeves off of that's maybe gonna have a little nip slip oh sure um i mean i did i was not an athletic You'll be shocked to know I wasn't an athletic kid. But when I was in high school, I did strength training for my gym classes instead of like gym gym. And it was very much the trend to just cut your t-shirts just all to pieces. Yeah. So like I had the same thing. I've been there. I think I have one in my closet. Um, they're not the be- cutest look, but sometimes you just you pitted out a t-shirt but the logo is still cool and so if you cut it into a tank top you can still wear it yeah i mean That's i'm with you i'd say <laughs> i used to do it all the time I, yeah all the time it was like the thing yeah to do um, in high school well this is uh luke's signature look when he's out on the farm is sure. being in a muscle sure. tee i um, will say i will caveat that it my acceptance depends on how far in you've cut the shirt. Yes. If I can see, like, no, fr- I mean, free the nibble, no body shame, but it's just a silly look to have a shirt that is cut so wide that you can see, like, nipples on either side of the cut. It's just yeah. like basically there's no middle. It's just a little goofy. Yeah. It's just go shirtless look. at that point. Just go shirtless um, at that point. So he anyway. obviously looks fine as hell. And she walks up on sure. him wearing his signature muscle shirt and boots and jeans and a turned back baseball cap. And I see he's got a your signature muscle shirt, boots and jeans and a baseball cap backwards. And he's got a nail between his teeth while he's fixing something. And he's got one of those smiles that makes his eyes crinkle at the side. Like, don't get me wrong. I love dimples, but I think that's cuter to me when they're like, eyes How crinkle. How dare you say that in front of me? I know. Do I do love dimples? I do love a dimple, but I'm sorry. So he's like, we're going to get you mounted up today. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> well then. 
and so he gets her on her oh moonshine is the retired horse's name oh that's delightful um and he gets her on her horse and he's talking her through it and he's calling her sugar that's like his nickname for her sugar <laughs> it's so cute i'm sure that works for <laughs> some people just yeah. let it happen okay don't ruin this for me i said i only you've been said very good said. about not I only said what I said and I've said nothing more. Okay. So she gets on the horse. Yay, victory. But then um, she sees him get on his horse and with all that, you know, muscle tea and backwards hat and damn. Sure. It's pretty hot. Uh, So they go around the corral a few times and she does great. And then, of course, there's a celebratory hug because she's so happy she did it. And then when they. Celebratory hug? Yeah, like, a yay, celebratory you did it. Hug. Then, what? A celebratory hug. I don't get it. A celebratory right. hug would be like, there's space for Jesus between. No, what did I say? Celebratory. Cel- like, like celibate. Cel- you just forgot an Celib- R. Celebratory. celebratory. Yeah. Okay, well, you know what I meant. It wouldn't be a good smut book if it was a celebratory hug. Oh my god. Okay. So <laughs> they hug is what I'm gonna tell you. Yeah. And their um, bits touch. And their bits are touching. And then they pull away and he's about to kiss her again. Who's gonna and say he, he's like, got a boner? <laughs> and he brushes the bottom of her lip with his thumb. And you think it's gonna happen. No, of course then... not, because w- the other brother who hasn't walked in yet has to walk in, right? <laughs> no, he actually just walks away. Oh, what the fuck? And I think he, like, his internal dialogue keeps being like, I cannot kiss my best friend's sister. I you cannot can. kiss my best friend's sister. And you we will could. get into this uh, whole brother's best friend misogynistic trope here in a little bit. But now fast forward. There's a wonderful visit Teddy gives Luke at his bar. Uh-huh. She comes in and she starts threatening him. And he's, she's like, I know you're a playboy. You're not going to fuck around with my best friend. And right. he's like, well, no, almost, quit almost making out with my friend. Literally. Because, of course, Emmy has told her that right. these almost kisses have happened. Yeah. And so he's uh, he's like, no, 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 we're just friends. And then all of a sudden, Teddy stops and she's like, oh, I see it now. Thanks for uh. clearing it up for me. And he's like, well, wait, what do you see? What what do you see? And she just walks out and she's like, oh, no, that's very threatening. Okay. And it's like. Then she's like, I'll cut your dick off if you do anything to her. My favorite so. thing is, again, my my good trope of this is normal behavior friends do. I always put my very good platonic friend up onto a counter and then nearly make out with them. That's a normal thing. We all got to start do. somewhere. We all, we all do that somewhere. with our we all do that with our good friends. So the Women's Professional Rodeo Association calls Emmy and wants her to participate in a competition that's coming to Meadowlark in the mm-hmm. next month. Um, and they know she's on a break, but they really want her to participate. She's like, I'll think about it. Now, there's some other subplots going on, including her brother, Wes, the one who's like very much a caretaker, wanting to start like kind of a hospitality business out of the ranch and make like a couple of guest houses that they can like rent out and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And um, like... He's feeling like, okay, Emmy had her racing career. Gus is going to inherit the ranch. Like, this is something that I want to take on. Spoiler alert, the next book that comes out in October, I believe, is Wes's book. So it's prepping us for Wes. Can we take a quick back track? And did they say the name of the, uh, like, official barrel racing group that wants her to race? Um, all they said was Women's Professional Rodeo Association. That's real. That's what that's actually called. I just wanted to confirm. That's that this is happening in the real world. The Women's Professional Rodeo Association is so Adam real. Driver exists in the real so world. So Adam Driver <laughs> exists in this world. Again, if you have listened to our past uh podcast, you'd understand that reference. Sorry, everybody. Um, so there's uh there's There's a lot of tropes in this book that I really (laughs) want us to dig into. Yes. And one trope is that women are rolling out of bed and answering the door in a skimpy top and panties. Which, if you remember back to our It Happened One Summer episode, this also happened. I've just, like, I've certainly had someone come to the door when I'm not, like, wearing the ideal outfit to greet them. But I've never then been like, well, nothing for it. And gone and answered the door 
You always have time to put clothes on. Uh, this morning, I had political people knocking at my door while I was still asleep. And sure enough, I did put on a t-shirt and shorts. So I also just wild. fully don't answer the door. <laughs> yeah, that's fair too. Here's a fun um, tactic I learned is don't answer the door because who could who could be coming that I need to talk to if I don't already know they're going to be here? And if exactly. I already know they're going to be here, I'm going to wear pants. Shocker. Well, this is precisely what happens when Luke knocks on her door at a very unreasonable hour and wakes her up. And well, she's like, "Well, if I knew it was Luke, then I would." Then I'm dropping the pants. Sorry, it depends on the person coming to the door. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, she's like, uh, "I." This is a direct quote. I couldn't even say good morning to him now because my nipples beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> Relatable, honestly. What did, what did he? That's, That's an the funniest opening shit. to a podcast. <laughs> That's the opening to the podcast. <laughs> and nipples beat me to it. And and then they poked his eyes out and he And then blind. they poked his eyes out. Again, reference our previous you, podcast. I've just been making callbacks left and right. It's going to really make are. no sense if you've never listened to our podcast before. So he tells her to put on a swimsuit and then takes her to a natural pool with a waterfall like up oh. in the mountains. And of course, it's his secret place. This is another trope where the main character has a secret place that they only show the love interest. They've never yeah. shown anybody else. Where does everyone find these oases? I don't know. It's Wyoming. Who knows? Um, so she's like the first person he's shown it to. They get into the water and are talking about the upcoming competition that everybody in town knows about now and is like, are you going to ride? Are you going to ride? Are you going to com compete? Like, Someone whatever. needs to shut their mouth. Yeah. Like, I mean. It's too small town. By the way, the chatting conditions include him holding her with her legs wrapped around his waist in the water. That's how Intimate. I talk to all of my very closest friends. I just wrap my legs around them. I have questions if that's true as your very close friend. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have, not, not we have never as, done that before. Not as close as you thought, huh, Sarah? <laughs> Podcast truth bomb. <laughs> Wow, I just found out our relationship status. Um, so she's like, not only do I want to race this one time again, I want to do it and win. But I'm not sure if I'm in the shape to win right now. And she's also like, I only really want to race this one last competition to say goodbye to the sport. Like, I'm kind of done. I'm and on he's the like, I'm going to work you out. And then they're going to bone? No. Oh, the come on. <laughs> not yet um so she's I like tried. i just want to say goodbye to the sport like i'm on the older end of the comp like competition and i'm mm -hmm. also just like over it now um and she's like i was diagnosed with adhd a few years ago and i feel like i've been dedicating myself to a million things at once and i'm giving them all my intention and now i just feel like i'm doing it out of impulse and not out of joy and so it's like a very real conversation not sure. cliche in my mind so then our boy Luke starts opening up too. And about five years ago when Riley was born and his dad died and he inherited all this stuff, he like didn't know how to cope with it. And he was kind of forced to grow up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately nothing happens um, at, in the natural spring. But when we end the chapter, she's like, I'm going to kiss this man today. I'm going to do it. I so now, would hope so. I would also hope so. So now we're switching to his point of view and he's walking her to the car and he opens up the door. But before she gets in, he like grabs the belt loop and like pulls her back. And I'm like, you know what? This is a little cute. It's a little cute. I'll mm -hmm. take it. Mm -hmm. it's so Sometimes cute. I do that on accident when like my pants pockets catch on a door. Yeah. <laughs> and it's my a house. little cute. <laughs> I'm like, oh, door. Door, what are you doing? Door, um, not here. Not here. Um, it's Tuesday. No, this is like the type of book that had me like giggling, kicking my feet. Like That's fun. Yeah, I like cute <laughs> stuff. It was very cute. Um, but then he like pulls her back and she like grabs his face and kisses him instead. And then quickly accuses him of chickening out twice. So she was like, I'm just gonna, I just did it because you kept chickening out. True. He and did, he non-threateningly grabs her by the throat and like pulls her into another kiss. Like it's uh, not threatening, like not like aggressive, aggressive. Oh, more yeah. Like I'm that. just pulling, I'm just pulling a face. Just pulling a face. It's um, not, it's not a negative face. It's just a face I'm pulling. You got your AC on. You feeling cool now because we're heating up. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, he picks her up 
and is making out with her against the truck. Nice. He moves her into the bench of his truck. Uh And then she point blank says, quote, I want you to fuck me in this truck. Sweet. Clear consent, folks. We love to see it. Clear and concise consent. Straight to the point. I should also interject that there is a third trope that we have now entered, which is main character. No, but I love it. Um, Main character uses love interest last name the whole time until it gets serious. And then they start calling it by the first name. I've almost not exactly that, but I've basically exactly done that with people before. Yes, because it's 100%. like hundred percent. It's like all fun and games, and then like you're like, Luke, like, I want you to fuck me in this truck. There's, there's very that's, that's so funny. There's very much someone I exclusively referred to as Checkers, and then I remember very distinctly when the shift happened, and I changed his contact in my phone to his actual name, and being like, wow. whoa, it's getting very serious. <laughs> I love this for I've you. All, I've 100% done that before. That's very I funny. love this for you. <laughs> so this whole time she's been calling him Brooks, but then now when they get down and dirty, he's Luke. Wow. Okay. So just as they're pulling off shirts, her phone rings and it's her brother, Gus. They what? let the phone go to voicemail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just ignore it. Sorry, I'm just and like they're about, man. They're about to start up again. When Luke's phone rings, oh, it's no. his best friend, Gus. Oh, no. <laughs> the best part is Gus is looking for Emmy. So when Luke answers and he's talking to him, Gus goes, like, she's not in her cabin and she's not in the stable. She's been helping you down there, right? <laughs> Hell <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we love a good in- unknown innuendo. Show enough. <laughs> Meanwhile, while he's on the phone with his best friend, Emmy's, like, cupping him through his jeans, like, Trying to, like, play with him, essentially. I think that's fine. Fun and games. At this point, we've addressed that the whole brother's best friend situation is going on, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone is hung up on Gus. Now, Hope and I talked off camera this last weekend when we were in the car car together for a very long ride. Sure did. That (laughs) they're... There's this video on TikTok of a, of a couple creators talking about how this trope is rooted in misogyny because it's the idea that men can be rakes or players and they can be friends with, with douchebag player boys, but they would never allow their sister to be with them. Right. And which is insane because like as a woman, I look at all my friends and like, yeah, you think about compatibility, but it's like, if I, if my brother were single and I was like, you know, he was interested in one of my friends, I would have questions and be a little weird about it. But I'd be like, you know what? I love this person. They're my friend. Of course I want you to be with somebody great, you know? So relationships between uh, siblings, friends, and and other people are famously not something I have a problem with. So. Well, and it's like, it's this idea that like, there's a double standard, right? Because men can go around and be um, like playboys essentially, Mm -hmm. but then women can't or can't engage with those types of men if they're respectable. just kind of like, I don't know if disempowering is a word, but like it kind of takes the power away from a woman a little bit because it's like, I don't trust that you can just make decisions to do what you want to do. yeah with full knowledge of what's going on i assume you don't know anything and that you're dumb and that you are gonna harm yourself so you shouldn't do it and i your brother tell like in this trope specifically i am telling you as your brother that you can't do it yeah you're a fully grown adult but i'm gonna tell you how it's gonna be right Mm mm-hmm well, so there's a family dinner night and obviously they're being really low key. And when they're all dishing out food, she like hooks a pinky with his for a second. Just to, like a little touch. It's so cute. There's a lot of moments like that where I was like, ee! you know, Aww, kicking feet, giggling. Um, That's cute. Turns out uh, they're all there to, because they're going to vote on Wes's plan to start that guest rental house. Oh, um. Sure. And the whole family, that how they make decisions on the ranch, the whole family has to unanimously pass it for it to go into effect. And so um, interesting. they've brought up this proposal before and like, you know, the older brother Gus was a little nervous about it and whatnot. But anyway, it gets approved by the whole family this time around and great for Wes. And the, it's all on his shoulders at this point. Anyway. Her dad is like, hey, Luke, will you walk 
Emmy back to her cabin because it's really dark and you know you should do that. Uh huh. I don't know. She might get eaten or something. By wild horses. <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know. So this during this walk, she kind of says like, "I don't need a label," but like, "Are you just messing around with your best friend's little sister?" Like, "Am I? Is this casual?" And he's like, "No." And like, he's like, "I wouldn't do that." to you i want to spend time with you i like being around you and so we've kind of dtr'd a little bit Uh to find uh the relationship uh a little uh bit one of my favorite lines was he's walking away she shut the door he's walking away and he says quote i couldn't believe the universe was so big and i got placed on this random floating rock at the same time as clementine rider oh cute that's nice he's walking away and then he has this moment where he's like fuck it and he starts walking back to the cabin. And then he fucks it. <laughs> he fucks the cabin. <laughs> well, no, I met her, but <laughs> he fucked the cabin. But so, sure. <laughs> anyway, don't worry, because she swings the door open just in time as he's coming back. And he's like, I can't stay away from you anymore. What I imagined before we proceed, what I imagined is that since I said, I said, and then he fucked it. And then you said, fucked the cabin. And then you said she opened the door. In my brain, the scene is that he's about to fuck the cabin. But don't worry, she opens the door. This is a whole nother smut book that we and have not. A Looney Tunes <laughs> Western smut I've invented in my head. She's going to write fanfic. I'm it. specifically not going to do that. Proceed with the smut scene. <laughs> so they start macking. And uh, he pushes her inside and she once again does the move where he's like holding her and her legs are around his waist, which Uh isn't fair for us tall, thick girls. Apparently she's tall, but I strongly disagree that this is not very easy for us tall girls, but whatever. Um, There's another very clear verbal consent moment. Mm -hmm, Our girl has an IUD and is all clear on STDs. So is he. That's Um, good communication. Always talk about that. Yeah, when they do this in books, it's very fun for me because I'm like, thank you for checking. Everybody's checking what they need to check. Yeah, Um, if you're not sure how to check those things, fully rip the dialogue from one of these books and insert it into your daily life. Just insert your own status. Yeah, I mean, don't lie. Don't, like, read the book and be like, this generally applies to me. But No, 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 no. Like, like, if you don't know how to ask, just be like, hey, just so you know, I'm clean. And yeah. I'm, you know, and then yeah. hopefully they will also attribute their information as well. Yeah. So um, then they get up to the bedroom and there's a fun little strip show in front of each other. And she says, your pants, I want them off. And our boy says, quote, that's the last command you give me. I'm in charge tonight. Do you understand? <laughs> well, Woof. Woof. <laughs> well, then. <laughs> Woof. Um, she proceeds to dry hump him through their underwear and reaches mm-hmm. an orgasm. Now, this is orgasm count number one. Mm-hmm. Oh, then I'm he... going to start a tally. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead. Then he goes down on her. And this is, we talked about this in a couple of other episodes where this is mm-hmm. great, a sex communication moment because she communicates to him, well, I've never got off on that and it's not worth your time. And he's like, not worth my time. Excuse me. He's like, that's not how that works. But let's give it a try and if you don't like it we will just move on oh that's good spoiler alert she likes it great that brings our orgasm count to two great okay. i've tallied it <laughs> great so then they have penetrative sex mm-hmm. uh and our orgasm count now comes to a total of three for emmy um also nice. if anybody is looking for like a decent smut book with a fair amount of dirty talk this is going to be your one like Ooh, he's good very verbal very uh talkative during the sex scenes don't worry because if you thought she hadn't had enough to orgasm the author gives us a one sentence description of a shower scene that includes an extra orgasm nice okay. how many are we at now four <laughs> because the next morning if you thought she hadn't had enough orgasms I in did a 12 hour stint, we all thought that yeah we all thought that they have sex yet again Woo-hoo! and that brings us to five the hot five mm-hmm. um so their little love bubble gets popped when wes starts knocking at the door these brothers just gotta knock it off man well to be fair i mean they don't think anything's going on i mean well, he knocked 
at least this time he knocked. Last time he just walked in. Look, I just you get let's just let's just go away for a bit. Well, what do you do at this point? If your brother's knocking at the door and your your man is in your bed post five orgasms. What are you gonna do? I mean, in real life, I'm just not gonna answer the door. Um in slightly less realistic book world, I'm gonna put my clothes on and then answer the door. I hope that's the answer. Don't worry, she opens the door uh, wearing his t-shirt. But don't worry, it's a plain black t-shirt, so like, could we get away with it? Maybe. It could be anybody's. Yeah, Um. and then he is hiding in the bathroom. But Wes is like, hey, I need some help with this project because one of our like hands is like out today. But um, also, have you seen Luke? Because his truck's still at the big house. So like, I did he get I'm thinking he got here early. So I'm going to go down to the stables and see if he's down there. Cool. How That's would fine. you not think my truck is still at the main house? I need to either move it or leave. Right. Like yeah. everybody's going to know that I spent the night or that I was here ridiculously. Yeah. If you don't, you know, if you don't like live on the ranch in a separate housing, which can happen. Like sometimes, yeah. sometimes ranch hands, I think li live on site and in trailers and stuff. But if you don't do that, then you have to maybe account for that or everybody's going to know your book. Yeah. Which is fine, but everyone's going to know. Yeah. And so when, before he leaves, he kind of says, I don't want to hide from your brothers. I have been the dirty little secret before. And I didn't care because they didn't mean I'll anything. I'll keep you my dirty little secret. Thank you. Thank you You're for welcome. that reference. You're welcome. Uh, he's like, I care about you too much. And she's like, okay, but like, give me some time. I just need to like, I'm working through a lot of things. Give me some time before we tell our, my brothers. Mm -hmm. So Emmy goes out for drinks for Teddy's birthday at the bar, the devil's boot. Um, it's the only bar I think there is in probably. Wyoming. All um, of Wyoming. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, and she's wearing a hot red dress Teddy made her. And this guy starts hitting on her. And of course, Luke is pissed off and threatens to kick the guy out. And the guy calls Emmy a bitch. And of course, Luke now has to beat the shit out of him and demands that he apologizes to Emmy. Yeah, I mean, it's not cool to just fight people. It's, I guess, the first thing I'll say. Mm -hmm. However, it's also not cool to call people bitches. So no, this is true. But then um, after he gets this guy to leave, Emmy's like obviously pissed that he caused a scene. But he throws her over his shoulder and brings her back to his office. In front of everybody. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, a choice. Very, very Neanderthal of him. That's an um, option. So she, uh, they start making out, kind of arguing, making out in his office. And at one point, because earlier in the night, he, she like asked him to take a shot with her. And like, she was like being very flirtatious at the bar with him. And then... Mm -hmm. He was like, oh, are you being a tease? Blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, I was just thirsty. And I wanted a drink. And he then puts, takes a pole of whiskey and then opens her mouth and spits the Spits whiskey it. in it. Interesting. And is like, are you thirsty now? So startling. Uh, kind of, <laughs> and I mean, this varies person to person. I'm a little thirsty. Uh, I don't know if everybody would have that same reaction. <laughs> But for some reason, she's like, this did it for me. So then I have effectively experienced that on accident before, which is that at my, oh yeah, at my cousin's bachelorette party, someone gave her a shot and didn't tell her what it was and it was whiskey. So she shot it and then immediately like put it back in the cup and then didn't tell me that and then gave it to me and then watched me do the shot and then was like, I had all of that in my mouth. Oh, no. It's a good thing I love my cousin. I've never been so upset. <laughs> oh, no. It's well, not, it's not ideal. This, this circumstance in the book sounds a lot more fun. Yes. And this is actually the pull quote that people use on book talk to like kind of sell this book as like hot and heavy mm -hmm. um, because it's like, okay, this man literally just spit whiskey into her mouth and mm -hmm. then has sex with her on top of his desk. And at the end, she's like, I just want you to know, like, I'm in like with you, which I kind of hate that, but whatever. And then after that, he was like, 
Oh, let's see how much you're in like with me after I go fight Chuck Norris 1v1 yeah. one because one, I'm actually a big strong horse. And we just combine both of our very And this good is a whole quotes. other smut book. Um, so she has a little car ride with her dad and uh, he she tells him that she doesn't want to race anymore. She wants to stay on the ranch. And he obviously is so happy she wants to come home and then kind of gets choked up and asks her if she wants to be like the horse riding instructor. Mm -hmm. And he also hints that he knows something's going on with her and Luke. And then they have this also, is it maybe because of his truck that stayed at their house overnight for no he, reason? He does say something along the line of like, nothing happens at rebel blue that I don't know about. And it's like creepy and a little weird, but all right. Ugh. And so he, uh, they also have a conversation about her mom and how much she is like her mom. And she asks him like, why do you not talk about her anymore? And his response is quote, when she's in my head, I can keep her safe. Aww. Which is like crying because it turns out that he was with her when she died because she was kicked and like hit that yeah. rock with her head and he mm -hmm. was with her. So it's like really precious. But anyway, so now we are two weeks away from the competition that's coming to town and Luke pu puts together a whole barrel race course for her in one of the are arenas and she starts getting nervous and he's like, quote, just because you got dusted doesn't mean you're done. Does it cue mean you're done and dusted? Yeah. Cue the title of the book. So there's also this kind of weird scene. And I, I didn't care for this part because it felt very random. But Luke gets this cryptic call from his mom uh, saying that her husband was supposed to be back from his truck route a few days ago, but never came home and she hasn't heard from him. What do you think that's about? What are your thoughts? Um, I'm just, it, you're right that it's random because I'm having a really hard time understanding why it matters. I assume that either, I mean, because he's a shitty dad, right? We talked well, about that a little bit. Isn't he a, the, mean, a isn't the impulsive dad? No, 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 dad? no. This is her husband, like the one she had an affair you know, like she cheated on him. So it's not his biological dad. Oh, it's the stepdad. It's the stepdad. So oh, I don't know his, uh, so just so you know, Luke and Emmy go over to his mom's house and she's like the trucking company can't find his truck. The last time he was located near ne Nevada. And, um, by the way, if it tells you how little contact he has with his mom, he didn't even think his mom had his phone number. Like, Yikes. so it's a little weird. She's calling him about her husband's disappearance. So, Things get a little tense uh, when Emmy offers to help his mom, like, you know, make her some food or whatever. And um, she's like, I don't need anything from the Ryder family. You took my son from me. And of course, Luke steps in. And oh, well, says, then. <laughs> yeah. And says, like, you didn't even want me here. It wasn't easy for me to be here. Also, don't talk to my girl that way. Don't do it. My girl. Don't talk to sugar that way. Don't talk to my sugar that way. Um. Things calm down for like two seconds before his brother walks in, JJ, and like tells him to get out of his dad's house and like really emotional scene because he kind of, Emmy kind of stands up for Luke in this moment to his brother. And he's mm -hmm. like, I've never had anybody stand up for me before, which is Aww. like fresh. All right. So now we're going to fast forward and we are at competition day. Woo. There's a lovely pep talk with Luke and Emmy um, before she goes into the arena and Teddy's there and she turns and goes, you're in love with her. And that's okay because she loves you too. Mm -hmm. And it's very cute. So not only does Emmy do an exceptional job, but she beats her own record. Woo! And it's kind of interesting. You brought up like that, that when they do the clover thing, mm -hmm. she, you typically go right. You can go mm -hmm. right or left, but you yeah. typically go right. She actually goes left. And like sure. all of her family's like, what the hell is she doing? It's it's the uh, sport film trope where you famously do something one way and then your coach or mentee is like, do it the opposite way. Do it the opposite way. And at first way. the sports person's like, that's crazy. I can't do it the crazy way. I only do it the normal way. But then yeah. in the big game at the end of the film, they try it the crazy way just once and it's just crazy enough to work. And it sure does because she... Beats her record and her whole family and friend crew comes to congratulate her. And how does she react? 
but by running and jumping into Luke's arms and kissing him in front of everybody. Wrapping her legs around his torso. <laughs> sure enough. Um, obviously, Big Brother Gus doesn't like this and starts shouting up a storm. Oh, no. By I, the way, think, for- I thought this would just end the book. I didn't anticipate no. more turmoil. No, just a little bit more. Oh, By man. the way, dad is just sitting back and smirking and like thinking this is the funniest shit. <laughs> it's just such a vibe. And then baby little Wes is just a confused little boy. Like, oh, huh. when did this happen? <laughs> like, poor little golden retriever boy. So Gus punches Luke. And thankfully, Luke like shoves Emmy behind him just in time. Otherwise, it would have been bad news bears. And she probably would have gotten hit on accident. But you worst, accidentally punch your own sister. Yeah, it happens, I guess, in the Wild West. And the worst part is that Gus calls Luke a screw up and a liar, which is not good for somebody with his trauma. Um, not great. And it's actually Teddy that steps in and says to Gus, get over yourself. Walk away before your daughter comes down here and sees you acting like this, you mm-hmm. know? And Gus walks away and then the dad steps in and says like, okay, Emmy, you need to leave with Teddy. I'm going to take Luke and we all just need a couple days to cool down. And during that time alone with Luke and dad, dad says he knows Luke has helped mend her broken heart and he thanks him for taking care of his baby girl. So Mm -hmm. very cute moment. God gives his root and his battles to his two and his cowboys. Sure enough. And you really, you really helped her through. So a couple days later, Gus comes to Luke. And after a well-rounded apology to her, Gus realizes it wasn't Luke that was trying to keep it a secret. It was Emmy who wanted to keep it on the DL. So he's like, okay, this is like really weird for me that you're dating my younger sister. But I will get over it. I just need some time to get used to this idea. And I sure. want to just be like, dumb, not your problem. Yeah, they literally... Like, yeah, I- it's really fine, but they whatever. are literally your adult, like adults, and they're literally your sister and best friend. And also, yeah. you just told him in this whole apology tour that he was one of the best men you knew. So, like, then why are you mad that he's with your sister? Yeah, I don't understand. I don't understand. And then Gus subtly is like, "Hey, look, this morning she's on Heifer Watch. If you want to go, you know, she's tell on her Heifer Watch. Which, by the way, um, I'm actually I- on Heifer Watch after we record. So." We should, we should really wrap it up. <laughs> um, by the way, for anybody who doesn't know, I lived with uh, pre-vet people, uh, shout out to Reagan, um, who taught me that the difference between a cow and a heifer is that cows are moms, like they've had babies, and heifers have not had babies. And I turned to her and I was like, I am a heifer. And I worked in the news. So I learned that a heifer watch means you have all the ingredients to make a heifer, but there's no heifer yet. And a heifer (laughs) warning means that the heifer is here and you can see it. And there's a present (laughs) danger. You must take cover from the heifer. Oh, tornado watches. Gotta love it. (laughs) Oh, what a flashback. Um, So he was like, look, if you want to go to that pasture or whatever and tell her you love her, you should probably do that. Mm -hmm. So Luke, of course, goes to her. He doesn't just go to her. He comes to her on a horse. He was so urgent to make it to her that he rode bareback and then practically jumped off the horse horse very fast. Be like, I gotta tell her. (laughs) But the best part is he's bareback. I don't know either, but he's bareback. Like that's so uncomfortable. Some people like it bareback. Anyway, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, so he jumps off the horse and he like grabs her and they profess their love to each other. Mm -hmm. Now, the epilogue, Mm -hmm. it starts with a sex scene and great start. start. And then they're getting ready because it's her first day of riding lessons. And apparently, by the way, remember how Luke's mom's husband, Luke's stepdad went missing? Yeah, I didn't really invest a lot of emotions into it because it kind of didn't seem like it mattered that much. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think that was really there to kind of tell the backstory of his relationship with his mom and his <laughs> brothers. Is, it's it's necessary for you to know that this lady's kind of a bitch. So. Yeah, well, he apparently went missing and went off the grid to likely do some gambling and then came home it was it just felt really pointless part of the story but not a single world in which i would have guessed that was the subplot of that thing yeah i know um so anyway they are getting ready for her first day of writing lessons and they're having uh 
breakfast and he uh, casually sets a key on the table as an invitation for her to like move in. And so they kind of, they have this beautiful ending. I just want to make a final note that Mm -hmm. can we have a moment to reflect that this romance didn't have a third act breakup, which I really appreciate. I don't need it. I don't like, it doesn't always need to happen. It's fine. If I don't experience a whole entire miscommunication trope. Yes. And I I'm okay with it's like, he doesn't need to have a huge fuck up for them to get back together and finally profess their love to each other. Yeah. Um, I don't, that's okay by me so um i am going to actually send you uh the a picture of the oh cover because i do not have a physical copy i read it on my kindle um so here is this if you want to give us a brief description again big fan of this um where are you uh, i'm putting it i sent it to you on facebook (laughs) Messenger, because that's the only way we engage with each other. That is deep insight to Hope and Sarah. It's exclusively how we communicate. It is. All right. Don and Dustin, this is uh, cute. So the illustration style, I think, is old fashioned looking on purpose. Like mm-hmm. the image quality is a little grainy. It's also a little bit comic booky, mm-hmm. kind of in like the print style. So you can see uh, Luke and Emmy on the front. They're in a sweet embrace. She's holding on to his cowboy hat. He's got like a hand in mm-hmm. her hair and on her back and they're macking, wearing jeans and uh, rugged farm shirts. And then yeah. the background is just like scenery. It doesn't look ranchy in particular, but there's like some fields and there's like a body of water and a blue sky and some nice clouds. And it's got very kind of Southern, almost gone with the wind font. That's like done and dusted. Yeah. It's very cute. Um, I like it a lot. So let's go through our rankings really quick. Um, Start with diversity for me. I am going to give it um, a two just because it does have the mental health representation. Um, What are you going to give it? Yes, I am also going to give it a two. A little closer to a one than a three in my heart because it's just, it's just. Yeah. White bread. Very white bread. White and bread less, I wrote and, low diversity frown face at the top of my notes. <laughs> um, what are you going to give the plot? I'm going to be giving it a four. Because um, yeah, I think I'm, I, I'm hung up on a couple of things that like just didn't follow through all the way for me. Like specifically that stepdad mm-hmm. going missing and like um, it was yeah. a, on the shorter end of a book. So some loose ends. Um I will give it like a fuck like a four and a half. I, the loose ends didn't bother me so much. I'll give it like a 4.5. Okay. Um, what are you going to give the smut? I'm going to give the smut one point for every orgasm in the first hookup for a total of five. <gasps> wow. <laughs> wow. I think it's great. I liked that first of all, I do also very like little cute squishy moments, like little like fingertips, mm-hmm. like stuff like that's fun for me. So that's we're already up to a good start. But I just I really again like when things are normal and people are just like straight up uh to to have a scene where someone's like, you can go down on me. It doesn't usually work. Here's some of my experience. Like I think having that really relatable stuff is awesome. So I rate things on high scales when I think it's relatable and cool. Yes. I'm going to give it a five too. I think for, for a Western, like, you know, we've, we did ice plane of barbarians, wild, mm-hmm. weird penis spur things going on, but like for a Western mm-hmm. where he's spitting whiskey in her mouth, different kind of spurs actually. Yeah, <laughs> different spurs. Um, so when, you know, he's, throwing her over his shoulder and taking her back to his office and he's really treating some, her like a bale of hay <laughs> yeah there's some dirty talk that's really great there's relatable sex content this feels like a five for me yeah um the cover i'm giving a five i love this cover i, I think also so love fun. the art a lot i also would give the cover a five it's All super right. cute so that brings our total out to i'm at an 80 percent and you're at an mm. 82.5 percent ah, very nice let's Good for us. out with what are our say smut what the smut moments yeah i guess it's it's whiskey spitting in the mouth but only like it only bothers me if there's not 
quite enough clear consent. Yeah. I didn't, I honestly didn't have a, a really like, what? Crazy moment to anything that happened in the book. No, I don't think, I mean, obviously the whiskey spitting is uh, up there. But um, also the, I wish I could just like, read verbatim all the smutty parts where he's just talking dirty to her the whole time Mm -hmm. um the dirty talk was great uh but um i think it was also like you know the relatability again in this book Mm -hmm. of the sexual content because at at point she was like you know i it's not that i haven't had sex it's not that I i have i don't have a lot of sex it's just like sex i'm i've never had a high sex drive and then like i've met this guy who I now have a very high sex drive for. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, And then I think plot wise, what drives me nuts is like, they, I mean, this man picked her up, threw her over his shoulder at his bar in front of a ton of people. And that didn't get around to his brother, her brother. Yeah. That's like the the town of people who are always telling each other shit uh, as proved by how everybody knew about the racehorse competition immediately uh somehow this was like ah that's normal behavior no need to tell anybody about that that i've seen yeah and also i plot wise i think the the stepdad whole thing i get that she was trying to like give context behind what the mom and luke relationship was but i just felt like it wasn't a strong enough plot point you could have just said that that his mom was kind of shitty and that would have been enough for me to be honest but yeah and the ex-boyfriend the fact that the ex-boyfriend kept texting her and then that didn't come to fruition to anything was kind of like okay you know but the prom date yeah the prom date also there's a scene i didn't include but like the prom date does ask her on a date at one point at the tractor Ooh. store and uh, uh tractor supply store and uh she... that smut rating to, to six out of five because i didn't <laughs> know that she was getting hit on in a tractor store damn son and she like turns him down and says like yeah i'm already seeing somebody so it kind of like doesn't come to fruition either um but hey overall it was a blast yes um, I, I, I had, had a thrill i had a root and toot and good time root and toot and good time um well, thanks for listening to our, our review of Done and Dusted. Thanks, everybody. Go and find us on all of our social medias, on TikTok and on Instagram and on Twitter at Say Smut Podcast. Also, again, if you have book recommendations, we would love to read them and check them out. If you want to tell us how great our podcast is, we would love that as well. You can email us recommendations at saysmutpodcast at gmail.com and then you can rate us and review us and subscribe to our podcast pretty much anywhere that podcasts go. And if you have something mean to say, you're entitled to that opinion, but know that I will not read it. I just won't. <laughs> I just, My anxiety can't handle uh, it. So I'm not going to read. I'm not going to read it. If you're mean, you can be, but I'm just not going to read it. That's fair. Well, everybody we're saddling up and we're moving out. Um, we'll see you at the next one. Get along little doggies. <laughs>